Yeah. Well, the second, the second lecturer is Elena Fumagalli, who is from the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. And uh, the title of her paper is Originals and Copies, Poussin Between Collecting and the Art Market. She has published on various aspects of uh, Florentine, Roman, Napolitan, and Modenian art history of the 16, of the era, from the 16th to the 18th century. Thank you. Thank you. In 1994, I contributed to the catalog of the unforgettable exhibition of Nicolas Poussin's work held in the Grand Palais in Paris under the direction of Pierre Rosenberg with an essay entitled Poussin et le collectionneur romain au XVIIe siècle. My aim was to start again from Francis Haskell's study of the relation between art and Roman society in the Seicento and then Tony Blunt's essay on Poussin and his Roman patrons, in order to update this fundamental text with some results of more recent studies, and wherever possible, to add new information by following new paths of documentary research. I'm grateful to Pierre Rosenberg and to the organizers of this uh, symposium for their invitation, as it spurs me today to look again at these topics, which in the meantime have been enriched by both facts and reflections. In the past 20 years, research on the Roman art world in the 17th century has given more and more space to the history of collecting and the market an aspect that is central to a full understanding of the circulation of artworks. The studies have brought into focus, much more than before, the dynamism of the market and of the collections, their diffusion on various levels, their sometimes unpredictable interview, and the involvement of protagonists of diverse status, noblemen, amateurs, artists, dealers, brokers. These topics are closely relevant to Poussin's career, especially at the outset. In connection with the exhibition organized by Sir Denis Maun in Rome in the winter 1998-1999, Nicolas Poussin works from his first years in Rome, they were taken into particular consideration, and even more so in the lively debate that ensued in various journals. They were also central to the first section of the catalogue Poussin and Nature by Pierre Rosenberg, published for the exhibition of Poussin's landscapes in Bilbao and New York in 2008. Compared to 20 years ago, Poussin's relation with the Roman art market is now better known, as well as acknowledged in studies. The idea has gained ground in which a good part of the painter's production from the moment he arrived in Rome in 1624 until the early 1630s was made for the market and not for one particular patron. His own biographers testify that his beginnings in Rome were difficult and that he had to resort to the market to sell his pictures. Giovan Pietro Bellori reports that he was introduced by his friend, the poet Giovan Battista Marino, to Marquis Marcello Sacchetti, and then by Sacchetti to Cardinal Francesco Barberini. But Marino's premature departure for Naples, where he died shortly thereafter, and Barberini's for Paris and Madrid on two missions between March 1625 and October 1626, put Poussin's entry into the high echelons of the circle of Pope Urban VIII on hold. Thus, the painter had to turn to the market, stooping to give his own works away for, little, for very little money, as was the case with a pair of bottles whose sale netted him only seven scudi apiece. These paintings are identified almost unanimously by critics as Joshua's victory over the Amorites and Joshua's victory over the Amalekites, 
now in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow and the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, respectively. This price seemed ridiculous in relation to the two paintings, but recent research on the Roman art market in the Seicento by Patrizia Cavazzini confirms to us that this was business as usual. I quote, youthful works by various artists could be found for sale, often for little money. Merchants might buy what local painters had in stock, or they might commission new works, the subjects of which would be agreed upon in advance. They might also act as an intermediary for a customer. Moreover, according to an important witness of the period in Rome, Giulio Mancini, it was impossible to establish the precise cost of a painting. A prince might pay 10 times what a work would fetch on the market. In recent years, the idea has taken hold that a certain number of paintings by Poussin dated in his first decade in Rome and recognizable in the known inventories of uh, private collections were purchased for the most part by dealers. This is true also of some of the early works by the painter identified in the collection of Cassiano dal Pozzo, the famous erudite collector and one of his major patrons. It is not clear how their relationship developed in the first few years given that Cassiano was in France and Spain with Cardinal Francesco Barberini for most of 1625 and 1626. Indeed, in many cases, it is not understood whether the many paintings by Poussin in the Dal Pozzo collection were acquired by Cassiano or by his younger brother, Carlo Antonio, and whether they were commissioned both on the market or received as gifts. On the other hand, precisely the example of Cassiano shows us how close the ties could be between a figure like him and the art market. We know, in fact, that the Genoese dealer Stefano Roccatagliata, a high-profile personality in the Roman art market, in 1623 was living in the Dal Pozzo household and maintained for his whole life a close relationship with Cassiano and Carlo Antonio just as he did with Poussin. Rocca Tagliata soon sold the works made by Poussin in his first years in Rome and may have guided him in following the orientations of the market. Numerous compositions are dated in this phase of the artist's career, many of them known in more than one version with few variants. The most frequent subjects are erotic or bacchic in nature, but there are also fables drawn from ancient literature set in landscape. It has been proposed, and recently by Timothy Standring, that Poussin's closeness to Marino may have reinforced the erotic inclination present in a certain number of his early works. Eroticized works were produced by the painter overall from 1624 to 1627. This sort of subject was readily saliable, and it is reasonable to postulate repetitions by Poussin himself. As an example, here is the sleeping nymph with satyrs in London National Gallery of about 1626-1627, in front of which the spectators feels like a voyeur. A similar but broader composition is in the Kunsthaus, Kunsthaus in Zurich. The same <coughs> is true for other analogous subjects, like the nymph and satyr drinking. Here the version in the National Gallery of Ireland on the left and that of Madrid Prado on the right. We know from late 17th century documents that in some stately homes in Rome, there was a room called the Room of the Venuses, where explicitly erotic paintings were hung. There is no reason not to think that this type of space already existed before, at the beginning of the century, 
and that consequently there was a demand for works to display in them. In February 1626, Poussin's destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, now in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, entered the collection of Cardinal Francesco Barberini. Payment for it was made by Matteo Sacchetti, brother of the Marquis Marcello and Cardinal Giulio, to Filippo Valenti, an intermediary, perhaps a dealer, I pointed out in 1994, not to the painter himself. Today we know that Valenti was an accountant for the Sacchetti Bank and acted on behalf of Matteo Sacchetti, who, like Cassiano, had followed Cardinal Barberini to France and Spain. The concluding words in the payment document, I quote, for the price paid in full in agreement with Mr. Matteo Sacchetti, bear witness to Matteo's active role in this business transaction. All these circumstances seems to me to confirm that the painting was not commissioned directly by Francesco Barberini, as supposed by other scholars. Or this was bought by him through an agreement between Sacchetti and Poussin, or it was, it was bought from Valenti himself, perhaps the owner. In any case, I see in this episode a primary role by Sacchetti, and link it to the words of Bellori, who said that De Sacchetti introduced the painter to the nephew of Urban VIII. So the first painting certainly commissioned by Cardinal Francesco to Poussin remains the death of Germanicus, today in the Minneapolis Institute of Art, executed in 1627 and settled in January 1628. A month later, Poussin received the public commission for the martyrdom of St. Erasmus for St. Peter's Basilica. But in the meantime, he did not stop working for the market and continued to paint autonomous works. The best known example of this seems to have been the plague at Ashdod, now in the Louvre. From the proceedings of a famous trial published by Jane Costello in 1950, we know that the painting was seen in an unfinished state in Poussin's studio around the end of 1630 by Fabrizio Valguarnera, a Sicilian nobleman and art lover who was involved in the world of the art market. He wanted it for himself, commissioning at the same time another painting whose subject seems to have been left to the artist's discretion and this was uh, the Empire of Flora now in Dresden. The circulation of paintings not only among collectors, but also among dealers and painters and among the artists themselves made the art market a highly dynamic place. Dating to the early 1630s are also the first mentions in documents of copies of paintings by Poussin. In 1631, Stefano Rocca Tagliata sold Valguarnera a small Poussin painting of King Midas, usually identified as the can base now in the Musée Fesch in Ajaccio, and a copy of the King Midas and Bacchus in the Alte Pinacothek in Munich, a composition that was greatly admired. These works, together with the already mentioned plug at Ashdod, ended up in the hands of Matteo Bonarelli, a sculptor in Bernini's entourage who must have been in early close contact with Poussin, given that Bonarelli owned other canvases by the painter, which, as Sarah McPhee's research has recently informed us, were inherited by his wife Costanza known for having been loved by Bernini himself. This is quite a considerable core of works by Poussin. The Midas at the source of the Pactolus in Ayaccio, the Parnassus in Madrid, the two early Bacchanals now in Rome, Galleria Nazionale of Palazzo Barberini, 
and perhaps the nymph riding a goat in the Hermitage. Perhaps this subject is specified precisely starting in 1647 in the collection of Antonio Ruffo in Messina, for whom it was bought in Rome by his brother. Did Bonarelli receive or bought these paintings from in order to market them himself? These hypotheses are eminently plausible. In 1634, Rocca Tagliata again sold to a Francesco Scarlatti from Florence, probably another art dealer, 54 paintings, including seven original by Poussin and five copies for 1,250 scudi. Two cursor inventories of these canvases list separately the subjects and the authors, making it impossible to recognize the pictures with any degree of certainty, even though I correctly identified some of them in 1994, as confirmed now by new documents discovered in the Archivio di Stato in Rome to be published soon in the Burlington magazine by Patrizia Cavazzini. These documents reveal the crucial role Roccatagliata played at the outset of Poussin's career in Cassiano dal Pozzo collecting, in the diffusion of copies after Poussin's works, and in the development of a state for his sensual pictures. On this occasion, Cassiano acted explicitly as a broker, a function he had to fulfill for Poussin alongside that of Patron. Among the paintings that Rocca Tagliata sold to Scarlatti, I already identified some works such as the Venus and Adonis now in the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, the Sacrifice of Noah at Tatton Park, and uh, the original of uh, Midas and Bacchus in the Alte Pinacothek. The Midas and Bacchus uh, in the Alte Pinacothek in, in Munich. Of, the, of this last painting, uh, you know that Rocca Tagliata had already sold one copy to Valguarnera. In fact, uh, as many Roman merchants did, Rocca Tagliata often commissioned various reproductions of the same paintings, especially of those he owned, presumably in order to sell them. We know that uh, at the same time that uh, he bought uh, the plague attached to the, from the artist, uh, Valguarnera commissioned uh, Angelo Caroselli to paint a copy for it, of it uh, for 35 scudi. The painting later came uh, by way of a sequence of property transfers uh, that uh, has been reconstructed precisely into the National Gallery in London. As uh, is well known, it is particularly interesting in relation to the original because of, different, uh, of the different solution adopted for the background architecture. When Valguarnera commissioned the copy by Caroselli in 1631, Caroselli was bound by a documented working relationship to Agostino Tassi, which lasted for some years. We know a list of paintings sold by Tassi in September 1634 to buy himself a chariot. Among this, we find another copy by Caroselli of a Poussin painting, whose subject is unfortunately not specified, as well as, I quote, a picture four handbreadths wide by Monsieur Poussin with a landscape and a nude woman and satyrs and a landscape, I quote, after the manner of Poussin. And this is uh, uh, what you said uh, yesterday about the um, people uh, were uh, conscious in uh, 1630s of uh, a manner of Poussin. Filippo Baldinucci reports that Caroselli was a well-known expert copist whose skill was recognized by Poussin himself. Poussin paid very close attention to the problem of the quality regarding the copy of a painting, a topic recently treated by Henry Kieser. 
we should not be at all surprised to find that Poussin himself indicated Caroselli to Valguarnera to copy his plug at Astot. Uh, the early documented circulation of copies of Poussin's paintings is another statement of the artist's close relation with the art market milieu. We need new research which will contribute to clarify even more the role of the protagonists of these fundamental years of the painter's career. Thank you. Well, we had our, thank you very much for your paper. We had two papers. The first one, we were told that Poussin was driven by God. Now we are told that Poussin is driven by the art market. He was probably, of course, driven by both. Would you like to start? Um, well, I mean, it's uh, a very interesting lecture. And I mean, uh, the beginning of this lecture goes back to the essay that Elena Fumagali wrote in '94, which was a crucial uh, text, of course. It's printed very smallly. Some of the most important um, in the discoveries of Elena were in a note, especially about the Scarlatti deal, which we know a little bit more now through an article which will come out, I don't know when, but in the verdict in the next week. So in a certain way, you have completed now a little bit what you said in 94, 95. A lot remains to be done, but in any case, the ma major point, which is now to be accepted is that the market for Poussin was at the beginning the effect of dealers. And it's only, not of course for the death of Germanicus, uh, only after a certain moment that he was able to sell to collectors directly. And the market was crucial for him at the beginning, where he was in Rome very poor, as we know, and had to make a living. And of yeah. course, the market pushed him on a pressure, uh, asking more and more pictures that he painted a little, sometimes a little bit too quickly and which are sometimes not his greatest picture. But I mean, uh, it's absolutely crucial what you, you have said. I mean, you know, and it's uh, a lot more that has to be done. And a lot of people have worked using your text of 94, trying to go a little bit farther. And uh, I mean, it's not finished.